All right, good afternoon everyone. I'm going to stay close to the microphone, but if you can't hear me, then uh, just wave at me and I'll be louder or, or even closer to the microphone. My name is Yuri Raymond. I'm a principal investigator at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Um, it's my third year now. I haven't done this for a while, but I have done a while uh, worked on pathway and network analysis. So this is what I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, so we're still on. All right, so the learning objectives of this module, uh, you should be able to identify situations where pathway network analysis is useful. And if you are working on a genomic or any other high throughput data, there will be plenty of situations where this is useful. Uh, you, you will learn about the main components of pathway enrichment analysis, uh, gene lists and pathways. And in our context, pathways are mostly sets of genes and many biologists find this a little counterintuitive, but it's the easiest to analyze them as sets of genes. And then a uh, boring but important part of pathway network analysis is uh, uh, different types of gene IDs. You can't get around with them. Um, and then uh, also you should be able to understand how gene sets come to be around. Where do they come from and what do they mean? So uh, hopefully many of you have been in this situation uh, about interpreting gene lists. My new uh, cool screen worked out finally or I performed this massive next generation sequencing experiment and I found a thousand genes. So what do I do about those thousand genes? And many technologies these days allow you to extract those thousands of genes from experiments. So maybe they represent uh, a differential gene expression analysis or a proteomic screen uh, or maybe something uh, about epigenomics where you identify regions of interest in the genome. In any case, these genes, uh, to go through them one by one is way too much. So we really need to focus on analytical techniques that allow us to analyze sets of genes um, quickly and, uh, and efficiently. So here's a small workflow. It looks like an old school microarray platform. Uh, we use some sort of genomics techniques or analysis techniques to rank or cluster or filter these genes. Uh, and we end up with a long list of candidates. What do we do next? We use tools that allow us to interpret those genes. Um, and then in order to interpret those genes, we really need to uh, use the body of knowledge of bio biology that has been accumulated over decades. That could be about the specific biological processes or the gene labels, gene annotations in different databases, uh, information about how genes interact or how proteins interact in cells. And uh, through those analysis tools, you may actually find out something really interesting about your experiment or a particular candidate gene of interest, and maybe you'll publish very soon. Um, there's an alternative approach. You can take your 100 list of, uh, hundreds, uh, so of genes and go to PubMed and do this one by one, and you'll realize that there's a lot of research out there. You could read 100 papers about each of your genes, end up reading 10,000 papers, and spend a lot of time. So pathway and network analysis is designed to create your, give you a shortcut to maybe focus on a couple of very interesting genes instead of your or 100 or 1,000. So what is pathway network analysis? This is one of uh, a potential uh, diagrams of how you use that in order to get to from genotype to phenotype. So on the genotype, uh, to genotype end, uh, you may have whole genome sequencing data. You have all these uh, hidden variation or copy number alterations or different strange things that happen in, in the genome. And on the other hand, you may have some observations. Some patients do better than others uh, in a Kaplan mile curve up, um, up on the uh, right-hand corner, or there's a differential gene expression analysis. Uh, you associate those two sets of data using uh, information from public databases. Maybe there have been um, uh, lots of large-scale experiments conducted earlier, experiments on things such as protein-protein interactions. There are large data bases out there where each gene has certain labels assigned to them over decades of research. There's a lot of literature and there's experts. So all of those sources um, contribute to what we know as pathways and networks. Uh, those diagrams of pathways um, have been based on very long research and maybe each one of those nodes and edges over here is someone's life's work. So pathway network analysis is any type of analysis that involves pathway network information. Most commonly, this is applied to interpret lists of genes. Uh, any contemporary paper will have some aspect to it, I, I would argue. 
Um, most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, but many others are useful. Sometimes these other types are more complex and make more assumptions on your underlying data. And it helps you gain mechanistic insight into large-scale high-throughput data, which we also often refer to as omics data. So it's a good shortcut, but sometimes overused. Um, what is the difference between pathways and networks? Uh, very often these th things are sort of mashed up together into one uh, concept. This is uh, what I think about those things and that kind of person and different people will tell you different things. On the one hand, we have uh, an, an EGFR centered pathway, which would be a very detailed diagram up to the point of molecular reactions where we know it, what each component does and how it uh, activates or represses another component. And very often these uh, uh, pathway diagrams also have infor information about the directionality. So perhaps EGFR is activating some down downstream targets under certain conditions. Uh, on the other hand, the EGFR-centered network uh, would be uh, something which is probably derived from a high-throughput experiment rather than careful literature curation. And um, we often don't know how these different genes or protein interact, interact with one another or what that interaction means biochemically, but we believe that there is a certain interaction. It could be a genetic interaction, a physical protein-protein interaction, or something that has been inferred by analyzing high-throughput data, often called a functional interaction. And then you'll see that this uh, EGFR-centered interaction network is actually part of a much bigger network, a uh, big uh, hairball of so to say, which is often uh, depicted in literature but not really interpreted to a great detail. What are the different types of pathways in network analysis? The first one that we'll focus mostly on today is called uh, pathway enrichment analysis or enrichment analysis of fixed gene sets. And there's a large body of tools that do that type of analysis. One of the most commonly used tools is called GSEA, which we won't talk about today, but instead we'll talk about another one called G-Profiler uh, for some uh, authorship reasons. And uh, the main input to that is a, is a list of genes that uh, someone derived from a high-throughput experiment, and then the output of that uh, uh, would be uh, the statement that this gene list is enriched in particular cellular processes, maybe cell cycle, apoptosis, some hallmarks of cancer, and so on. So another one would be a de novo subnetwork construction or clustering, where you may have a list of candidate genes that you're interested in, and then you try to draw a network between these candidate genes using existing network information. So you'll say, you know, 20% of my genes make up this big uh, interaction network among themselves. And now the third type of analysis that we could use in this kind of classification is a pathways-based modeling, where we use the pathway structure or network um, uh, as a scaffold, and then we make hypotheses about which gene might inter uh, interact with, with which other gene may actually activate that gene or repress that gene uh, in gene expression studies, uh, and so on. And you'll see that perhaps the first part of uh, uh, this uh, classification is the simplest part. It makes the least assumption on, on available data. All you need is a gene set and the gene list. And on the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you actually need to believe that the uh, uh, the data structure or the underlying pathway or network is very reliable. You may also need to have some sort of additional observational data such as gene expression, transcriptome values, and so on. Uh, so to summarize, uh, if you uh, think about, um, say, cancer genomics data, some mutations perhaps, uh, you would ask what biological processes are altered by somatic mutations in my list of genes. Uh, in the second case, you would ask uh, whether there are some new unknown pathways altered by mutations in this cancer. Maybe there are some clinically relevant uh, tumor subtypes that are representative of particular networks. And in the third case, you would say how are different pathway activities altered in this particular patient? And maybe there are drug targetable pathways in this patient because we see that you know downstream genes of a particular pathway are always downregulated. Maybe the pathway itself is downregulated as well or deactivated. So, as I mentioned, uh, in this lecture we will mostly talk about that part, the gene, gene uh, set enrichment analysis. However, further lectures away will touch upon the others as well. So, why would you analyze pathways rather than single genes uh, or single SNPs or single proteins or, or something along these lines? So, one good argument is that you inc increase your statistical power. So statistical power uh, is the notion of recovering these, uh, uh, these similar results if you had a different data set and how likely it is uh, given the number of tests that you do. Uh, 
uh, when you focus on one gene at a time, you uh, probably have to go through 20,000 genes that are tested if you're thinking about human genes that are coding proteins. Uh, if you have a SNP array from Affymetrics, then you may, may look at the million SNPs. Um, now, if you look at the pathway and network space, you're probably going to look at a few thousand different pathways. Therefore, you make fewer tests and you will more likely find the same pathways again if you looked at a different data set. So it's kind of like a statistical power issue, but it's also more reproducible. So we'll, you will combine your many genes into fewer pathways and you may be able to make a more reproducible research. Uh, pathways are way easier to interpret than genes because genes, when you look at the list of genes, it's like an alphabet soup of symbols and numbers and letters. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at pathway data, then it's more like textbook biology. So cell cycle gets activated, maybe there's a developmental pathway that you learned uh, in, um, in the university about, and so on. Uh, you would, may, al may also uh, find clues about underlying mechanisms in your experiment. If you do a case control analysis between healthy samples and disease samples, pathway network analysis may tell you what's, what's wrong with the disease samples or what pathway may be uh, disabled. And you could also predict new roles to genes. Uh, so if you have some unknown genes uh, in your set and they seem to behave very similarly to uh, known members of a pathway, then maybe you have found another uh, newly described member of that pathway. Before you go into pathway analysis, uh, you have to think about a few different things. Uh, first of all, it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, your data better be high quality because pathway analysis is a type of an analysis which may give you an answer even though your data is flawed. So one example that comes to mind is that uh, you perform, say, transcriptomic uh, uh, assays, you do next generation sequencing on RNA, and in your samples, uh, an apoptotic pathway shows up. Why could that be? maybe because you left the, uh, the cells lying on your bench for, for a while. So uh, things like that are often very uh, easy to happen and then the pathway analysis will give you an answer because it, it detected upregulation of apoptotic genes. Uh, genes need to be normalized beforehand uh, and uh, depending on which pathway analysis you use, uh, you, you may need to use a different type of normalization. RNA-seq uh, requires different normalization com compared to, say, microRNAs. Uh, background adjustment is also important. Uh, sometimes uh, you know that uh, your candidate gene list can only contain one, one particular type of genes and nothing else, and then pathway analysis needs to be adjusted to take that into, into account. Um, I will talk about this a little later, but you may need to make sure that the particular type of gene IDs that you use are also compatible with the software that you use. So there's a lot of caveats, uh, but uh, these days many of the tools are really easy to use. So what is the general workflow of this type of analysis? Uh, first you collect your uh, genomics data, omics data, proteins, uh, RNA, uh, single nucleotide variants and so on. Then you normalize and rank and uh, score them. Uh, oftentimes that uh, step already happens at the core facility, so that's great. And then you generate the, uh, a list of genes that are act as your candidates, and then you use these various pathway network approaches to learn about cellular mechanisms, uh, candidate genes, uh, characteristic pathways and processes, and so on. And within that green step, there are many other different steps that are applied. So statistics is one. Uh, we rely on statistical alg algorithms and multiple testing correction to identify pathways. Visualization has a, has a key effect because many times these pathways are very redundant among one another. You may have uh, dozens of pathways highlighted by the statistical analysis, but they're actually all the same thing. Um, and then uh, you can drill down to understand molecular mechanism, perhaps going back from the discovered pathways up towards the genes that you found and then associate genes and pathways in a more detailed um, analysis and then ideally you'll publish the model explaining the data where you integrate some of the pathway network elements. So how could you end up with so many sort of redundant um, I'll get to that but uh, the key question is there's a biological reason and a technological reason. Uh, there's a lot of crosstalk between pathways you know, the same gene can be part of multiple pathways, but also the ways pathways is, uh, are represented in databases is very redundant. Uh, we'll talk about gene ontology soon, but gene ontology is like a tree where leaves are very, very specific, uh, you know, even reactions, and higher nodes are very broad processes like metabolism. Um, 
and they are contained within each other. So what is pathway enrichment analysis statistically? Uh, this is essentially a Venn diagram with a little bit of statistics happening in the middle section. Um, so we're comparing in each test, we have a gene list from our experiment, which may be your differentially expressed genes or genes with a cancer mutation or something like that. And then there are genes from annotated in databases. For instance, every gene that's known to be involved in neurotransmitter signaling. Okay, and maybe your experiment was about uh, drug sensitivity in, in brain cancer. And so then you compare those two lists of genes with one another, and you can statistically compare them using something called the Fisher's exact test, for, instance, for example, and then that will tell you whether the proportion of uh, genes in your experiment uh, and the proportion of genes of neurotransmitters, whether that shared proportion was way higher than expected according to a statistical metric. So you test that across many, many pathways, and th that is essentially pathway enrichment analysis. And if indeed neurotransmitter signaling comes out in um, sensitive, uh, in drug-sensitive brain cancer cell lines, then that might give you a, a hypothesis that perhaps that neurotransmitter signaling has something to do with drug uh, resistance or uh, drug delivery in, in that brain cancer. Um, an example of a tool that performs this type of analysis is G-Profiler. Uh, that I uh, developed during my PhD uh, in Estonia a few years ago. And then this is an example output of that particular tool. Maybe not. Um, all right, so that colored block over here are your input genes. Uh, and then uh, the pathways go from uh, uh, top to bottom uh, that are shown on the left e edge of the screen. And there are various p-values over here saying how unexpected uh, the presence of so many genes of these pathways in your candidate lists uh, was. And then there are various uh, numerical values, and those colors tell you something as well that I'll tell you in a bit. Now, mm, this is really dark. I hope you can see it, but uh, actually one of the goals is to convince you that there's a lot of data on the screen that you <laughs> don't necessarily want to see. If you have a rich data set at hand, this is a typical result. You'll have hundreds of pathways that become out as enriched, and that's partly because they're very redundant. So uh, you have a, a well-performing experiment. You have a lot of characteristic pathways coming out of your, say, case control RNA-seq data set, and then you'll get uh, dozens to hundreds of pathways that you don't want to analyze one by one. And this is where we use a network visualization that's called an enrichment map, uh, where each node of this network, so each colored circle, represents one pathway. And they are grouped together with similar pathways using these green uh, edges. Um, and the motivation here is that uh, you group together similar pathways if they share similar genes. And if you, uh, if you do that consistently and systematically, then those groups of redundant pathways, those many redundant pathways, will instead become uh, subnetworks or network modules. And then it becomes much easier to inter interpret. So instead of uh, having uh, 300 pathways, you'll have uh, maybe 20 different groups. And these groups are very often, uh, you can just look at them and uh, give a three-letter, three-word summary what that actually represents. Can I ask a question? Yep. Uh, what would you say are like, the pros and cons uh, of the um, profile compared to the other tools in the same So uh, why, uh, you know, when somebody all right. I'll give you a short answer comparing G-Profiler and GSA. Actually, there's probably like dozens of tools that do different aspects of this research. The main difference between G-Profiler and GSA is the type of a gene list you provide as input. So G-Profiler will work with a list of 10 genes, and will it will work with a list of... Uh, say, a 1,000 or 2,000 genes. GSA always requires you to input the gene list that's equivalent to the size of the protein coding genome. So 20,000 is the standard input for GSA. And for some analysis, it's, it's perfectly fine. You have, a say, a transcriptomic data set where you have a gene expression value for every gene. And then GSA is appropriate because you have a value for every gene. Um, in the G-profiler context, um, you would have pre-filtered that gene list to get the statistically significant differences, and only then you go to G-Profiler. So GSCA works in, it's designed for gene expression data. It doesn't really work with the same proteomics data. 
Uh, so G profiler is more general, but it won't analyze the entire list of genes for you. So let's say you want to do a sort of middle ground, for example, you have a list of genes with high given enzymes that is somewhere like 8,000 range. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Where do you go for that? I'll, I'll repeat the question. So if there is a, a large gene list, but it doesn't cover everything, say 8,000 genes coming from an enhancer profiling experiment, um, I would uh, just take a step back and say, what do you want to find? What is characteristic of 8,000 genes? What is the label you want to put it on a pathway context? Um, it sounds like if it covers, say, uh, 50, 60 percent, or 50 percent of, you know, annotated genes altogether, then statistically you are not going to get a very a large number of meaningful enrichments. So. Um, I would attempt to rank that gene list according to, say, strength of enhancer signal, and then uh, um, take the top thousand genes according to that. If you don't have a good statistical measure of drawing a cutoff, um, yeah. All right. Um, so where we stopped was, I suppose, uh, this long list of dark green uh, uh, lines moving to a network and uh, I wanted to show you an example of a recent analysis where we investigated uh, tumor heterogeneity in a particular uh, central nervous system tumor called ependymoma uh, which is uh, occurs in children as well as adults and then researchers uh, in that in the paper they were showing that there is no single class of ependymoma but there's about nine different subtypes which have clinical characteristics and molecular characteristics and histology differences and so on. So our task in this analysis was to figure out which different subtypes of those nine, what types of pathways and networks uh, and functions are representative of those. So we, um, we used a technique similar to G-Profiler uh, to annotate these highly expressed gene sets for every uh, different tumor subtypes. And we ended up with this uh, colorful visualization using the enrichment map where different groups of network nodes highlighted here represent different uh, uh, pathways activated in each of the subtypes. And colors represent the subtypes, so you can see that some of those areas of this complex map are annotated by multiple colors, so multiple subtypes had an enrichment in that pathway, um, and others that are, are unicolor, so they, they were characteristic of only one subtype. So there's a lot of uh, um, omics going into this uh, figure, but yet it's quite easy to read and understand at least on a, on a broad level. So uh, having seen this hopefully motivating example, let's go into the details a little bit. First uh, is where do gene lists come from? And this is what you actually know the best, because you know your experiment the best. But broadly speaking, um, we, we do all kinds of molecular profiling and pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, out of the box best works with the data where each gene was supposed to have a signal. So you do a, a genome-wide screen for every gene, and then every gene will have a signal, and then the, when, that's when pathway analysis works the best. So the simplest type is just gene list, which is, uh, doesn't have any meaningful order to it. It's a list of genes, and this is where you apply a tool like G-Profiler. Um, then there is a second type of list, which could be a list of genes along with values. So maybe values of uh, fold change relative to cases and controls. And then if you have a full list of those fold changes, you may want to look at the tool like GSCA. And uh, then you can do all kinds of ranking and clustering and other custom approaches to analyze that data. And then maybe you do a clustering analysis of your data and then each cluster becomes your gene list. And you can analyze those gene lists separately. A whole different uh, way of doing pathway enrichment analysis is to focus on networks as input. So you, you could look at your favorite gene or protein and everyone, every other protein that interacts with that protein and then do a pathway enrichment analysis on those proteins. It can become more complex as we just discussed about enhancers. You may look at uh, you know, gene regulatory regions of the genome or microRNA target sets of genes uh, and uh, analyze pathways in those cases. They become a little special cases, especially those that are out there in the large whole genome because not always will you know which enhancer regulates which gene. So there's a tool called GREAT that uh, I think will be talked about later, which will account for distal regulatory elements um, and two pathway enrichment analysis on those. 
uh, you can look at the genetic screen, for example, a knockout library, and see which essential genes come out and analyze those in the pathway context. And then uh, you can also look at association studies, uh, GWAS studies, look at single nucleotide variants, copy number variants. Um, these further examples are often haunted by the fact that you don't know which genes those distal or non-coding variants regulate. Uh, and there are many other examples. I think it's worth mentioning right here uh, that when you do a pathway enrichment analysis uh, on an omics screen uh, or an omics, on an omics data set that doesn't cover every protein or every gene in the genome, you need to be careful to set something that we call the background set. So a background group of genes for a pathway enrichment analysis. So an example of that would be a phosphoproteomic experiment where uh, proteomics people will know that not every protein will be phosphorylated. There's about 10,000 proteins or maybe half of the proteins in the human proteome that get phosphorylated ever. And therefore, when you do pathway enrichment analysis on those type of data, you have to provide those 10,000 as a so-called background set. And that's important because otherwise every phosphorylation-related process will have very highly amplified p-values and it will make your interpretation difficult. What do gene lists mean? Um, gene lists uh, are coming from an experiment and they describe a particular uh, uh, aspect of your experiment. They may represent a complex or a pathway or physical interactions. Uh, sometimes they represent um, genes with similar function that are activated, maybe protein kinases when you treat them with a kinase inhibitor. They could represent a, a tissue specificity when you're comparing uh, tumor samples with adjacent normal tissue. Uh, or they could uh, represent chromosomal location for uh, copy number variant analysis, which covers multiple genes. So biological questions that you ask uh, when you do a pathway enrichment analysis, this is something that you should actually start your experimental design with. So one very typical way of analyzing a gene list is to say, these are the characteristic biological processes active in that gene list. Another one is to perform differential analysis where you have cases and controls, and you want to see uh, the biological processes that are representative of cases relative to controls. Um, you may be after finding a regulatory uh, gene or an RNA that controls your genes of interest. Or you may want to discover new gene function. Um, and these are questions that uh, can be answered directly or indirectly using pathway enrichment analysis. Um, I'll go through this again uh, quickly. Pathway enrichment analysis allows you to summarize and compare gene lists. Um, network analysis looks at the interaction networks, which is a slightly different uh, beast, but also uh, can be computationally more complex and you make certain assumptions. Um, and then there's a regulatory network analysis lecture coming on uh, as well, where you are, your goal is to find regulators of those genes, either transcription factors, uh, microRNAs, long known coding RNAs, or so on. Pathway enrichment analysis has these two input components. Gene list is something that comes out of your uh, data analysis and pathways or gene sets are those that are part of public databases. And then the, there are these various tools such as Amigo, GSCA, GProfiler that provide um, an intersection between gene lists and pathways and retrieve enriched pathways. Other components include gene identifiers, various gene annotations, um, and uh, where to get them. So let's um, get over these protein and identifiers first. Uh, identifiers are, um, usually, are ideally unique, stable names of numbers that track uh, database records. Now it's interesting that many people will refer to their genes as gene symbols, so a, a four-letter code and a number. It turns out that these actually change quite a lot. So over the years, maybe 10% of those names change, so we should really watch out. Um, so, you know, social insurance number is an example of a number that doesn't change over time usually, and that's a good one because you can always refer to a person through that number, but the name can change, it becomes more difficult. Uh, uh, further, some databases refer to as the units of interest uh, as genes, other as DNA regions, yet others as RNAs or proteins. So when you're trying to integrate data especially, then it turns out that this becomes a challenge because genes don't uniquely link to proteins, uh, or RNA or DNA. Um, so it's important to always recognize what types of identifiers are you working with and start to resolve these uh, associations that are not one-to-one. -one. Um, so here's just a short overview of different uh, 
types of gene identifiers. I believe gProfiler deals with hundreds of different types of gene identifiers. Um, the good ones are those that are highlighted in red. Uh, so, for example, when you're working with genes, these ensemble gene identifiers, UNSG mm -hmm. and a large number of uh, digits, these are usually stable, they don't change over time, uh, and so are Andre gene identifiers. On the other hand, uh, Hugo, HGNC, or Human Genome Nomenclature Symbols, BRCA2 is an example over here, these sometimes change over time. And these are kind of up to researchers to name their genes in publications and rename them. And often there are these uh, uh, nasty examples of things going um, wrong. I'll have another example here. Uh, software tools uh, sometimes of recognize only a handful uh, of types of identifiers. So they may fail uh, to recognize certain uh, identifiers. And that can be problematic, especially if you have a mixed list of different types. Um, so the best uh, way is to deal with that preemptively and try to organize your input gene list uh, into one single type as soon as you can. Um, and then that can be done with certain tools, but sometimes uh, you won't be able to curate your list automatically uh, 100% and then you need to review some, some gene symbols that look weird. Uh, so you need to avoid one too many mappings. Um, in cases where one symbol points to many different different genes, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity. For example, P53, which is probably the most studied gene on, on Earth, has also many names due to the fact that it's so much studied. Um, so you better use the official symbol or even just one of those database identifiers that are claimed to never change. Um, don't use Excel. Or if you do, be very careful about it. Oct4 is not October 4 in the context of the uh, genes. <laughs> and uh, there are some other examples of September and, uh, and so on. Uh, so if you have to use Excel, then, then there's a way to paste your lists as text. And I, I'm surprised that I think this is not the default option. You just have to do it every time. So here's a nasty cautious, uh, cautionary example where People published a Nature paper maybe 15 years ago and then published their retraction because they had looked at their own gene symbol. So don't do that. Huh? Can you repeat that? So they, they claim in this uh, sort of uh, retraction note that they were thinking that they were analyzing a particular gene, but instead they, it turned out it was a different gene entirely. So the different gene is not as important as the initial one, that's why the retraction is paper? I haven't really followed it, but. Um, Yes, I mean, there's, there's two different genes called HES1, and then the symbol had changed. Um, I think it's worth looking into that if you're really interested. Here it just serves as an example of caution. So to practically address this, um, there are different tools. Um, G-Convert out of G-Profiler is one tool where you can select um, your target choice of a gene ID, and you can paste in a mixed set of IDs, and it will give you this... Uh, comprehensive table of what maps to what, uh, along with uh, little descriptions that allow you to read if it really makes sense. Uh, G-Convert is actually based on the Ensemble database where we automatically pull these biomark tables of what identifier maps to what other identifier in order to provide these comprehensive mappings. And to be honest, this is not perfect either because besides official identifiers, uh, there's a jungle of uh, aliases and deprecated gene symbols and things that don't really go into the system. And if they would, they would mess up things uh, even more. So on the, on the right edge, you'll see this example of different human gene identifiers that can be mapped. And this list goes on and on. So besides databases, they could also represent experimental platforms such as um, microarray probe set identifiers and many, many other things. Um, okay, if you're working on proteins and genes, uh, then it's a little easier because you don't have to worry about uh, alternative splicing or, uh, or well, protein isoforms. Then you can map, map everything to Andre gene IDs or official gene symbols. Watch out for official gene symbols because they map to date sometimes and they also sometimes change. If you really want 100% coverage, you should manually curate missing mappings using multiple databases. Gene cards is one, for example, where you can look up your gene, gene names. Um, and then remember to format yourselves a, as text before you paste. So quick summary of what we've learned so far. Uh, genes and their products have many different identifiers. 
Um, some tools handle that automatically, so others don't, others are restricted to certain types of IDs. And when you do genomics, then you often need to convert one type of ID from another, especially if you do, let's say, multivariate genomics analysis of multiple different data sets. Um, and use standard commonly used IDs as soon as possible in order to avoid that, uh, that chaos later on. So the second component that we should talk about is pathways or gene sets or processes um, that can be uh, difficult or, well, not difficult, but diverse. Uh, the, main, uh, the main source of those is gene ontology uh, as, a, as well as pathway databases such as Reactome. Yeah? One question about the gene Uh, do, you, do you mean translating uh, between the identifiers of that model organism or between different organisms? Uh, to translate between different organisms, you first need to find the homologous genes. Uh, there is a tool in G-Profiler which I won't be able to cover, but it will map uh, uh, from one species to another species. Um, but uh, within the species, uh, uh, there are other databases, obviously. So there's a mouse genomics uh, database and the yeast genomics database and they also uh, deal with different symbols uh, and different database identifiers and the problems are similar and, and those uh, the G profiler tool set works with many different species so uh, hopefully it applies to that, those problems most of things are identical but there are some genes that do function differently in species. So you have to think about the functionality. And also, that the existence of one gene doesn't necessarily mean that say that there'll be the existence of a protein within, uh, within that other organism. So just doing a simple gene name to gene name translation, Don't do I would that. argue is dodgy, dangerous, and best avoided. Uh, sorry. I'll be teaching you tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're in. There. That's okay. Also, uh, a single gene in human may have multiple copies in another species. Uh, I think it's mostly vice versa. So, a single gene in a worm may have like a family of genes in, in human. Okay. And so, pathways and other gene function attributes. So, uh, I'm I have pretty liberally used the word pathways. But this actually refle reflects, in this context, any set of genes with some sort of functional relationship, uh, which is well defined. So all of these sets of genes are available in databases. Um, in terms of pathways, uh, our primary resource are the sets of genes corresponding to biological processes in, in gene ontology, and then various pathway databases. Reactome is a great resource for human databases, for example, as is KEG. Um, and the different uh, species will have their species-specific databases of, of pathways. And then there are these other annotations that are not necessarily corresponding to uh, the classical definition of a pathway. For example, in gene ontology, there's another branch of the tree called molecular function, which is more about biochemistry and how things uh, react to one, one another. And then the third ontology is the cell location or cell component ontology, which is about organelles and uh, uh, cell parts. Um, you could also interpret the gene set as a, a list of co-located genes, so something that are all in a particular chromosome region or a, an arm. Uh, you could also group genes according to their disease association. A very common one is like the cancer gene census set of genes. Um, you could look at some DNA properties, for example, do they share common enhancers or common transcription factor binding sites, um, or do they share microRNA binding sites in their, uh, in their untranslated regions. And similarly about protein interactions or protein properties such as do they carry a particular protein domain. So the same type of simple statistical approach of association applies to many other things besides, uh, you know, bona fide pathways. What is a gene ontology? So a gene ontology um, is a st structured dictionary. Uh, the technical term is a, a directly acyclic graph which almost looks like a tree. Uh, but it's not a tree because uh, there are additional connections in the tree. So the root of the tree is something very, very general. The one important root of uh, gene ontology is the biological process. And then the leaves of the tree are very specific uh, 
processes, maybe they have only one known gene that is involved in that process. And then intermediate branches of the tree will represent the more general and specific parts of what we know about biology. It's important to know that, that there is one gene ontology, and that represents the, the biology of bacteria, the biology of humans, the biology of, I don't know, whales. Everything is supposed to be a part of that ontology. And then what matters are the gene annotations. So uh, humans will have certain gene annotations, and plants will have others, and bacteria yet yet others. And so here's an example. Uh, this is um, one certain part of the gene ontology. The topmost term is biological process. Then it uh, goes uh, further down to more specific parts. Uh, there's a cellular process, there's cell death, there's B-cell apoptosis at the very bottom, and it goes on and further. Um, and then the diff these are the different annotations and genes get assigned to them. Um, and then uh, these go terms are associated with different types of uh, relationships. One uh, term could be a part of another term, or it could be a more uh, specific uh, uh, representation of another term. So that describes levels, uh, different levels of detail for gene function. And uh, the important part, uh, the important technical note here is why this is not a tree, is that terms can have more than one parent or child. So B-cell apoptosis is a, is a type of an apoptosis, but it's also a type of a B-cell homeostasis. So this is how we describe biology formally. What does Go cover? Um, for pathway enrichment analysis, probably the most important part is the biological process. For example, the biological process here is a cell division process. So that's what cells go under. Uh, other parts of Go are cellular components. So here's a cell uh, with its membranes, for example, and then molecular functions. Uh, the detailed molecular functions such as glucose, 6-phosphate, isomerase activity. Where do Go terms come from? Uh, Go terms are added by human editors at the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, as well as gene annotation databases and you'll see that this is a very large and detailed effort because the Go is supposed to represent uh, all kinds of biology out there. And um, uh, there are also expert developments where major branches of Go are rearranged or deleted or, um, or created. It's important to note that this is not a static entity. It uh, evolves quite rapidly over time. And then this graph is a little outdated, but you'll see that uh, you know, cell component uh, grew over 30% between 2012 and 2015. And that is as we learn more about biology, especially in these days of uh, high throughput uh, Omics data, we, these annotations uh, grow rapidly, but also the underlying vocabulary grows rapidly. Um, okay, so annotations are actually the things, uh, the associations between a particular Go term and the gene of interest. And these, are, these happen as um, papers get published and as expert uh, um, curators look at these papers and they decide that uh, the researchers found an association between a gene and the process. Um, and uh, genes will have multiple annotations because they belong to multiple processes uh, found out in different studies over time. Um, and it's also important to notice that these annotations have various standards of quality. So some uh, gene annotations happen automatically. An algorithm goes through large databases and assigns these gene annotations. And in other cases, there are, there's a team of experts reading a paper and deciding what that gene is doing. So not, not all of these annotations are born equal, and uh, that's something that you may want to pay attention to when you do practical analysis. So, and why do genes have actually multiple annotations? And we had a question earlier, where does all the redundancy come from? Here's the technical reason for redundancy. You see this entire tree that starts with the biological process, and, the, and the, at the bottom, at the most specific level, that's the B-cell apoptosis. There's the aurora kinase B, or or, or KB, which is a particular kinase, and then the researcher associated that kinase to B-cell apoptosis. Now, according to the rules of this dictionary, uh, automatic associations immediately are assigned to every parent node of this B-cell apoptosis. So basically, aurora kinase B annotation gets propagated all the way up to biological process, so it becomes associated with B-cell homeostasis, apoptosis, program cell death, and all these different annotations. So that's why when you do a pathway enrichment analysis on a rich data set, you'll get these hundreds and hundreds of results.
Um, all right, I think we went through this already, but uh, the key point is that you have to be aware of the origin of that annotation. Um, for example, a uh, human will have uh, fewer experimental evidence of annotations compared to mouse, where we have uh, way more ways to uh, study mice uh, due to ethics and so on. Um, and then many of these mouse annotations are then propagated to human because there's uh, evidence from model organisms. And that is coded into the uh, various types of annotations that are represented in pathway analysis tools that will tell you how did that gene get annotated to that process. Uh, here's just a brief overview. You don't need to know them really, uh, but there are some evidence codes that will tell you that this gene was associated to a process thanks to experimental evidence, all the way to knockout experiments and so on. Um, and then there's this uh, uh, lower level evidence which is called IEA, inferred from electronic annotation, uh, where it was just an algorithm that was matching up the genes and annotations based on uh, uh, homology, for example, or, or various different approaches. So you would say you'd probably trust the IEAs a little less than, say, functional experiments in cell lines. Um, in G-Profiler, the colored boxes represent the evidence codes. Uh, and then uh, visually the evidence codes that are blue and green are, are weaker evidence and those that are in the dark red range are, are more functional experiments, more mechanistic experiments. So when you perform this type of analysis, uh, you'll see the screen and it will tell you whether it's mostly red and mostly reliable or uh, if it has a lot of blue colors then it's uh, probably derived from uh, computational analysis. Uh, gene ontology and the annotations actually cover a surprisingly large amount of uh, genomes and many of them are annotated through homologous genes. Um, besides human, we have uh, information about all major eukaryotic model organisms uh, as well as bacterial and parasite species and then uh, those types of information are curated at uh, uh, species-specific uh, databases and consortia and, uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uh, variable coverage. Uh, this is a chart that shows you how many um, annotations there are for genes per species. And on the far left, uh, uh, the largest is human, obviously, and, uh, and mice and rats. And on the other hand, there are uh, yeast and E. coli. Uh, and you can see also that there's a large num number of experimental, uh, but way larger amount of non-experimental annotations telling you that uh, not all of that information is very high quality. And there's a big list of different uh, contributing databases that generate these annotations to genes, but also contribute to creation of the gene ontology structure. Um, the Go resources themselves are freely available, so you're welcome to download either the tree structure as a file or any of the annotation files. And there's a very large community of bioinformaticians that are developing tools and approaches uh, for these um, uh, Go analysis uh, pipelines. Um, there's a study that we performed, uh, one of the first studies in my lab was uh, we, we asked whether uh, gene ontology annotations as such uh, have a best before date and it turned out that they do. Uh, one of the most common tools that uh, was used in the recent years uh, is called uh, David and I'm sure that many of you have heard of that tool. Um, so it was known that David was out of date way before we published this, this paper, but basically we went out to PubMed and counted the different um, uh, Go analysis tools and how frequently they were cited. And David came up uh, by far with the largest number of citations. And in this plot, we correlated the number of citations uh, uh, to the number of uh, uh, times or the, the most recent update of that software. So it turned out that David when it was cited by thousands of papers in 2015, the information into David, uh, into going into David was from 2010. So five years uh, or even more at that point, we wondered how much effect does that really have on the interpretability of these results. It is very fair to note that when we put out our paper into BioArchive, uh, then David suddenly woke up and was updated very quickly. So <laughs> since then, I think David is not no longer updated uh, seven years ago, but it's updated more recently. Uh, but uh, 
you should still pay attention if you're using David or not, like when, were the, when was the last update of that software. Pardon? GSEA? Uh, that's a good point. Uh, for GSEA, you need to provide your own data uh, of gene sets. So all these tools over here, they use their own gene ontology on the web. When you run GSEA, uh, you have to download a data set and put that into GSEA. So that will, your analysis will depend on how fresh data you are using. Right, uh, there is a re resource where you go and download. And to be honest, I think that the MSIGDB resource is what you refer to. That is pretty recently uh, or frequently updated. Yeah, I was just going to add about the MCDB. Um, they're waiting for funding. So they're actually not as updated as they usually are. All right. So well, there's a bit of a holding pattern until new funding comes along. And then this is, this is Yuri and I can have a beer over this later. About yeah. MCDB is a highly used resource out there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unusual that it's actually falling into the same category as but I don't. Uh, so it may be, maybe it's one year or two years behind, but it's definitely not lagging by five or ten years. Yeah. So obviously, this is not only because tool developers are lazy; it's also because tool developers run out of funding, the graduate students leave. There's a lot of different reasons why uh, tools are not outdated, and that becomes a whole different discussion. Yes, but there's another person developing it, so that's, right. that's fine. Um, right, so as a user, you need to pay attention. Um, and then uh, there is a quantitative evidence that you need to pay attention. So when we compared uh, annotations that were at that point six years old, and we performed a pathway enrichment analysis of a particular set of genes from brain cancer, and uh, we asked how much information is an outdated database missing then that, uh, that amounted to 75%. So, uh, you know, one out of four pathways will be found if you use this earlier um, outdated data set. And if you use a very recent data set, so from 2018, you'll find 100%. Um, and then some of those are very uh, clear why these wouldn't come out from these earlier databases. For example, draggable pathways. There were no drugs to drug those pathways uh, back in 2010, but now there are drugs to drug those pathways, so they show up in a pathway enrichment analysis. So there is a lot of reason for that. We have these new omics technologies that update the gene ontology annotations very rapidly. Um, there's also a lot, a lot more effort to uh, collect them because there's, uh, there's more data, therefore it needs to be analyzed more often. And there's also the technical reason of as the Go uh, tree gets wider and wider, each gene will naturally ac accumulate more annotations because of these, you know, annotate or propagate uh, rules up to the top of the tree. Uh, more about Pathway Databases. Pathway Commons is a resource developed in, uh, in Toronto that, uh, that has aggregated information up, uh, from many different Pathway Databases and then it becomes a super resource where you can look up sets of genes and see why they're annotated in different, uh, in different uh, individual databases. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, this analysis is very general. It doesn't need to apply only to biological processes and molecular pathways, but you can use all these other annotations. And that uh, there's a large number of those annotations. It doesn't mean that for every task you should consider them all because you'll overwhelm yourself with the results. Um, and there's the other reason of if you analyze too much data at the same time, false discovery rate will become much more stringent and you may lose results. So, when you look at these other types of annotations, usually we recommend that you look at pathways first and see what comes up and then maybe selectively look at some of those other annotations depending on what you're after. So for a proteomics experiment, it maybe doesn't make sense to look at transcription factors, for example, or vice versa. Or if you don't really know much about microRNAs, then why, why consider them in the first run? Just try looking at, uh, say, reactome pathways and uh, gene ontology biological processes first 
and then then dig deeper into these other annotations whose quality is also variable. So what have we learned? Um, pathways and um, other gene attributes come from databases. Databases need to be up, up to date. Um, uh, gene ontology is one of the major resources. Um, gene ontology itself is like a, a dictionary of biology and the, this dictionary has structure and then um, gene annotations uh, or links to that dictionary uh, are contributed by many groups. Uh, each gene will probably have multiple annotations and sometimes that's a large number. Uh, and those annotations have different quality because sometimes they're human curated and sometimes they're machine curated. Some genomes are more annotated than others. Uh, human researchers uh, have a privilege to that, to that uh, extent, while others may have more trouble, especially if it's a very exotic uh, animal that no one ever sequenced besides you. And sometimes there's a, there are representations of Go that are not as redundant. So there's a, a version of Go called Go Slim, which can be used. Um, annotation, as annotation is variable quality, some tools allow you to filter annotations. So G-Profiler allows you to filter electronic annotations uh, to get a more confident snapshot of the pathways that are part of your gene list. Um, and many gene attributes are, are available. Um, one example of uh, availability is the database of Ensemble, which is uh, up updated, I think, every four months. Uh, and uh, Ensemble Biomart allows you to go and download these large tables that have all the information uh, if, if you need it. So here's the workflow that we showed earlier. You collect some data, you, you perform statistical analysis on that data, you generate the gene list. Uh, and then you perform a pathway enrichment analysis that allows you to learn about uh, the mechanism and vi visualize and, um, and publish. But well, it's not often as simple. So uh, first of all, like the first layer of collecting data can mean a, a, a myriad of things. Um, analyzing that data is also not a single step, but it will depend on what, what you're actually analyzing. Um, but that uh, the fact that you generate the gene list that is very often universal. So when you do a when you do a, many of these omics experiments, you end up with a list of genes or proteins, or maybe genomic loci. But that also becomes a li list of genes eventually. And there are many different tools and approaches to analyze that data. Um, I think a common rule of thumb is that a very simple analysis, um, such as a gene list analysis also makes the least assumptions. While if you want to do a very complex, uh, say, modeling of, uh, of uh, gene expression levels in a pathway, then you make more assumptions because you, you have to know the pathway very well and your you know, observational data also needs to be uh, high quality. So the things that we discussed today are pretty uh, generally applicable, while you can always go more complex. Um, so finally, when you're interested in pathway enrichment analysis of omics data, uh, we recently published, uh, pre-published pre in BioArchive, a very comprehensive uh, protocol paper about um, how to perform this type of pathway enrichment analysis, starting from a gene list, list or gene set, uh, all the way to uh, analysis or visualization with the enrichment map. And that covers both GSEA and G-Profiler, and some of it is R code, and some of it is a step-by-step uh, step step, uh, clickable manual. And it's, um, it's close to 100 pages, I believe, and it's currently in revisions. So uh, after I finish this lecture, I'll go back to looking at the text. But it's already available, so you should definitely have a look if you're interested. Mm -hmm.